Suspense is spelled with three S's. And those three S's should stand for slowly show something. Hey guys, uh, welcome to Inside Comics with uh, George McHale. Um, really quick, if you like this kind of content, make sure you subscribe and tell about a friend about it. Uh, today I'm joined by writer, illustrator, GMB Kamichuk, and Jonathan Ball, writer as well. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the show, guys. Um, Thanks for having us. So you guys Thank have you. a... Yeah, absolutely. Um, you have a Kickstarter out right now uh, for an anthology project, a huge one, 144 pages. It's called The Dead Work. And uh, we're going to get into what specifically that project is, but we're going to... Uh, first, talk about uh, building suspense in comic books. Um, so, su suspense is defined as a state of feeling of excited or anxious uncertainty about what may happen. Um, why do you think suspense is important in comic books? Well, George, as long as we are um, going straight to the dictionary definition, let's unpack that word for a second. Suspense is spelled with three S's. And those three S's should stand for slowly show something. This is how you build suspense. You do it a little at a time. And even if you go a little more meta, you look at where the S's are placed in the word. You want to staccato it throughout your story, but you have to have things in the middle. Otherwise, it just feels like um, you're getting right to it. The difference between suspense and, say, uh, pure horror or body horror is really all about the pacing and at the rate in which you want to show something terrible. Um, now, Jonathan is an excellent horror writer, um, a nightmare crafter. And I think um, I've learned a lot about how to pace my own illustrated stories by reading some of his uh, short stories and writing. So I would be curious to see what he has to say. Let me answer on a really craft level. What I think the most useful tool that a writer has at their disposal, they're trying to build suspense, is a thing called the periodic sentence. So this is a particular type of sentence, grammatically speaking, where uh, the meaning of the sentence does not become clear until you affix the final words. So the way that periodic sentences work, you know, is it's something like, uh, you know, I went to the store because I really needed to do something special which was find Bob and kill him. Do you see how the last part, so, so the first part of that sentence, it, it, it sets up a, uh, a meaning chain that isn't ever completed until you hit the end, but you know that it's incomplete. So it's a really particular type of sentence where the actual semantic content, you know, what that set, those words mean, uh, what is being said in the sentence doesn't, it starts like Gregory's talking about. It starts and that you know establishes that there is a thing that is coming. You know, information is coming that you need to understand what I'm even talking about now. But it doesn't, but it keeps delaying it. And then it closes it out right at the end, not in the middle, uh, right? Uh, at the very end. So I think there's a couple things that writers, especially writers of comics, really need to understand. One is that that type of sentence is the best way to write dialogue uh, because people tend to just kind of read the end. Like they remember the thing at the end of the dialogue. Uh, so in a screenplay or in a comic, uh, that type of sentence is the best way to write dialogue, broadly speaking. But additionally, when you're talking comics, especially that type of structuring uh, in a scene works really well. And if you can, you know, set up again, there's something happening, but we don't exactly know what's happening. And then we have to turn the page to find out what's happening. So that's sort of, it's not technically a periodic sentence, but I think the page turn can operate sort of in a scene in comics, the way that you know, grammatically you can structure a sentence to pace the reader through. And the other thing to just sort of keep in your head when you're uh, thinking in this manner, if, if you're trying to, going to try to sort of craft these more and more and study them, strangely, the best thing to do is to watch comedy because jokes are structured in periodic sentences almost always, right? You know, it's set up punchline and then they have to delay the punch to the end. If you take a really good comic and watch like a good Netflix special or something, you know, about some standup, find their jokes that you really like and write them down. 
And notice how if you rearrange the words, the jokes don't work. And the reason they don't work, even if it's the same words and the same idea, is because the structure of those sentences is, is setting up an idea, uh, setting up an expectation, and then they subvert the expectation. They don't give you what you're actually expecting. But they do give you a completion to the sort of premise of the thought that they've set up at the very end. Like that's how a really good joke works. And it's also strangely how horror works uh, on a structural craft level, whether you're writing prose or, you know, structuring it a scene in a comic. You know, it reminds me, makes me think, Jonathan, that good jokes, you know, really funny observational comedy is often a cautionary tale. That's really what they are. And if you go back into, say, uh, the writing of fairy tales or you look at fables that have lasted where you look at the original versions and some horrible ending befalls the child or the family, that, that's exactly it. It's a surprise ending at the at the conclusion of what seems like a pretty mundane explanation of everyday life. Oh, no, you got eaten by a wolf in the woods who is a skin changer, right? Like these are sudden punctuated moments and you can build that into your storytelling. Yes, but it's really worth pointing out to kind of add on to what you're saying here. The the suddenness is still the completion of an earlier setup. Thing. Yes, absolutely. Like it's not it's not random, even yeah. though it's sudden. Whereas well, in life, so many why things. Why it occurs that are to me is random. that the bad thing always happens right at the end, and then the story's over. But it's a logic. Yeah, yeah. you're right, of course. But it's also the completion of a logic. Like it's a surprising often completion and it's often sudden and sharp, you know, this big jolt, but it is still a completion. So when you're laying out a page, you often will work that way, right? You'll start at the top left and you'll panel down to like the, you know, the meaning of the page completes. And then you'll turn the page to complete the scene meaning maybe, you know, with a thing. But it, George, again, it even works in dialogue. George, in Cover of Darkness and in the, the little story that we worked on for cover your Cover of Darkness universe, that was... Your editorial notes had had less to do with my storytelling in the individual pages and more to do with if we're going to turn a page and reveal something, let's make it exciting at least, right? And so yeah, well, I think so every every odd number page in comic books, uh, you know, asks a question, and every even number when you turn that page and you have that page turn reveal, that reveals a question. Just and I really I really like your comparison there, Jonathan, to comedy because how many people have went and seen like just you know, the funniest comedian and then around the water cooler the next day at work, you're trying to tell your coworkers that that same joke and you're just butchering it. And it's, it's because you're not structuring it the right way. Right. And the same thing with horror. Like if I just say, Hey, some guy killed that guy. Well, it's not scary, but if you tell a story and you lead up to it and you just, and then, and you build the suspense and then it ha hits, that's, that's what gives you that, that jolt of adrenaline. Let's just look at your example there. Like if you're if you're doing horror and you're like, there's a, a monster is hiding behind that door. It's like, well, that's not scary. But there's a door and you opened it and there was a monster. You know, that's the structure of horror, right? You just gotta you gotta kind of set it up and delay it. And and horror like comedy is, you know, like so one of the things I think about when I'm making horror and we're working on eye collector right now and the stuff we did for uh, She Wolf in the dead work, um, that the reader has to know more than the character knows and so the reader knows oh it's gonna be bad for you mr character who hasn't turned around but i can see into the panel and you can't right when we see a character uh facing quote unquote camera in comics facing towards the reader anything behind them that is terrible we know before they do that helps build suspense um and that is why a joke works the person telling a joke knows where they're going and they know what to withhold until just the right moment. And that's what makes it funny. That's also what makes it scary and important to note from a, you know, just a brain chemistry point of view, the limbic system in your brain doesn't differentiate between scary and sad. Those are the same reactionary parts of your brain. And so you have, you can use the same tools to unleash human emotion you just have to change the theme or the tone of the artwork or the or the delivery in order to tell the reader what they're supposed to feel. But that they feel something you can create in a predictable way. You also have a really good point in there that you're making, Gregory, which is that um, we're, we're in the in horror, especially the audience needs to kind of have that knowledge that the writer has to a certain degree, not as 
play, but more than the characters. In comedy, you know, it's a little bit reverse, right? Like, as you say, like, you know, the comedian knows the punchline, but you don't know the punchline yet, uh, right? You know, so you kind of find out when everyone else finds out, and that's part of the joke. But in horror, it really, you kind of need the audience to understand it that more than the character does. Because as you say, like, go back to that door thing again. When it's like, they go to the door and they go to open it and turn it and open it, and then there's a monster behind. The monster isn't what's scary, actually, to the audience. It's scary to the character, but the, to the audience, what's scary is that they're turning the doorknob. And so to go back to your suspense idea, like what you're actually generating when you generate suspense is this audience interest in the gap between when they know something's coming, you signaled that something's coming, and then you're going to give it to them, like give them something cool that's coming. But their awareness of and them sitting in that gap is what's actually generating suspense. So it's a very weird, you know, and, and complicated uh, effect. But you know, which is why, of course, so many people have a hard time with it. I'll uh, say too that it's it's like as long as we're jumping around with comparisons, um, you know, comedy and stage magic is that same kind of thing. You come to a comedian knowing you're you're hoping to laugh. You know that's what you're you're setting up. You go to a magician knowing that you'll be fooled you open a horror story hoping to be afraid and so you're willing to suspend certain amounts of disbelief specifically and contextually within the story if you were reading a coverless horror story you didn't know it was a horror story it actually wouldn't surprise you as much it's because you read you know something is killing the children on the cover that you I don't want to know. You actually don't want the answer. Yeah, you're like, right? well, what is it? You know, that's yeah, you don't really want to know. It creates the question immediately. Uh, Cover mm -hmm. of Darkness is a great example because uh, in your in your own work, you're trying. You're mostly making how you sell the book is almost like a uh, like a monster fight extravaganza, but that actually belies some of the fun storytelling which is like how we get to each monster or how we build up to those monsters someone comes knowing i like monsters but how you deliver it right is what makes it a delicious feast you know along the way and that's what you're trying to do with suspense is you're trying to you're trying to use those s's in just the right uh in just the right places in your story i love your question and answer idea and i think especially as you say works in comics to put the questions in certain places what i think is a really useful because again something we, that was suspense what suspense does is it gets us to turn the page right is that page turner uh, effect is is so often the domain of suspense writers um but i one thing that's a really useful just little trick in there is like when you set up a question and then you ask the question make sure that like the answer also kind of contains a new question yeah so that we always have this kind of chaining going it's the Mario Brothers example, right? You're hopping along yeah. and you see the, in the distance, you see the little cube with the question mark on it. But between you and that cube is the danger. You got to hop on it. You got to avoid it, whatever. And it's, if you want to keep revealing new mystery boxes, you have to jump over the next creature, right? And once you hit it, you make sure there's another one over here you can see at yeah. that moment. To yeah. drive you along. So recently I did a, a, a spoiler review of the new Scream movie. And uh, I, I was on someone else's uh, YouTube channel and he asked me like, well, you know, what was your favorite part of the, the movie? What was your favorite kill? I, I couldn't even really remember the kill specifically. It was like, for me, the favorite part was when I knew the killer was in the house and the character didn't know uh, and he was, that he was being stalked. And so you're waiting and you're, you know, he's opening the refrigerator door and it's like, oh, is the killer going to be behind the door when he closes that door? And just like, there's so many teases of of when is this killer going to come out and that for me was like the you know it just had me on edge right knowing something that the the character doesn't know and that that's suspense to me uh in a lot of ways um i do want to get into the dead work let's let's talk about what is this project it's a huge one it's 144 pages it's on kickstarter right now there's a link uh in the description of this video to the kickstarter but can you tell me what is this project I'll tell you how it started. It started as a whole bunch of creative folks during what we've come to call the event uh, in our circles uh, saying, we all have these little comics projects, this dead work, like little ideas. Like I wrote a short story, it ended like this. I don't know what else I can do with it. Oh, I wrote this short uh, fantasy thing. I don't know what I can do with it. It's complete. 
but it's not big enough to be its own comic. Um, and there was, you know, about eight of us. And I said, why don't we just put them all together into one big collection of our dead work? Um, and it sort of came from there. I was trying to pivot it to, to brand it as a super pulp science, which is the podcast uh, I run, a collection so that I could take credit for everyone's work. And then um, the collective, as they've come to be known, said, no, we're going to rename it according to what we're doing, which is a collection of experimental science fiction, fantasy, uh, horror, like esoteric fantasy, micro stories. Some of them are only three pages, like... Um, Old Steve some Ditko one done page. ones or yeah. one pages. And some of them are, um, you know, 10, 12 page sort of complete yarns. Um, what a wonderful collection. And where it's quite incestuous in a way because the writers on some are the illustrators on others, are the letterers on others, are the uh, colorists on others. Like we all traded our skill sets around and it just made like a big um, haunted mixtape of a book for people. Yeah, me and Gregory, uh, of course, are on a, we have a different comic series called The Eye Collector out with Heavy Metal, but Dead Work kind of has this one-off, almost like a kind of sequel idea. Uh, it's not connected to The Eye Collector, but it's like the kind of the next thing that we sort of worked on together, this comic She-Wolf um, that I really, you know, wanted to do and wrangled Gregory into. Uh, and then there's a bunch of work that Gregory had, uh, you know, some of his own like self-contained that he wrote and draw drew together. And, and he's worked as a writer with Justin Curry, who's in the book. I worked with as a writer with um, uh, another artist called Stephen Call and another artist called Christopher Smith. And there's and there's just, you know, all these different other pe great people in it that have just been working with one another over the years. Um, and recently, especially, you know, Linda Redchenka, uh, who does letters for our eye collector book did the letters for a bunch of the stuff in here and he did some writing for some other comics in there and so it's it's really a night like a kind of the people who have been doing stuff in our circle and kind of just intermingling uh getting a chance to kind of really just show how they've uh, been building up this body of work in the, our little community here it's it's our way to kind of make a love letter to comics that we were didn't realize we were all writing one at the same time you know, and then when we started sort of showing our work, it's so important if you're a creative person to show your work to your peers, um, because once you start doing that, you start to realize the connections that can be made. And in our case, we started realizing, oh, man, all these work is kind of thematically or at least the flavor. It tastes good together. There are a bunch of different flavors that taste good together. Uh, and once the book was all laid out, um, we were all kind of in awe of how much work was actually there, number one. Uh, and how greatly it fit together, even though there's all these different um, hands making the stories. Just uh, and, something we're really proud of. And a lot of it's really fun. Like some of it's just like straight up one shot, you know, one page joke comics. Other ones are really like, they kind of got a horror or sci-fi element, but they're really action-y, but they're also very funny. So how many stories in total are there in this 144 page collection? Uh, that's a good question. Um, like two it's gotta, dozen? Yeah, it's got to be around two dozen for yeah. sure. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. That's a, that's it's a lot awesome. of like content. If, you're, if you are someone who is like interested in making comics and doing short, like I 100% think that a real silver bullet in a person who's trying to break into comics is being able to tell a short story in comics. Uh, why? Mm -hmm. Because you can send it to editors. It doesn't waste anybody's time. It demonstrates that you can tell a story, get in and out, establish your premise, lay it out, get things done and get the hell out of there. Um, and this book is chock full of really great examples of that exact thing. Set up the whole premise in a very short time and then deliver the outcome. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm just so proud to be between those two covers. And just to underscore what you're saying, Gregory, like we all know from working in comics that when you're talking to an editor, like they really want to see a complete story. Whether it's two pages or one page or six pages or 22 pages, they want to see a complete one and not an excerpt from one. Uh, and so, you know, some of these are that, you know, stories that are meant, you know, sort of to pitch out a larger idea. So like my Dirk Dirksen thing is a complete self-contained story, but I very much want to use that in a pitch, right? To expand things other ones are just sort of they're meant to be one-offs and they're just you know doing it for the sake of doing a one-off so i think it's a nice combination of like 
it's all complete stories that are really interesting, cool and interesting, but some of them have real legs, you know, to like a longer thing. And so it's kind of like the first glimpse you'll get of something that's maybe coming down the pipe as well for some of them. Well, uh, so the dead work is on Kickstarter right now. Everyone, there's a link in the in the description of this video. Go click that link. Go check out this uh, project. Go back this book. Um, GMB Kamichuk, uh, Jonathan Ball, I want to thank you for being on uh, Inside Comics, and uh, I'll catch you next time. Peace. Thanks, George. Thanks so much.